You're listening to the Ortho K podcast. The Ortho K podcast is sponsored by the Orthokeratology Academy of America. Go to www.orthokacademy.com. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Dr. Tom Wyshevsky, and I'll be your host for this ongoing OAA podcast series. Just a bit of background about me. I've been involved with orthokeratology for more than 20 years, have been a member of the OAA since its inception, have served on the board of directors for the past four years, and the co-chair of the mentor committee, as well as the co-host for the Vision by Design Bootcamp. Okay, so we're here at Vision by Design, and I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Jeffrey Cooper. And for those of you who may not be aware, Jeff is probably the number one proponent of atropine use for myopia control in the United States. Not only the number one proponent, but probably the most knowledgeable and has the most experience with. So Jeff, tell me, what was it that attracted you to the use of atropine for the treatment of myopia? Well, the way back uh, around 2000, there were enough patients who would come to me and they'd say, my, uh, my parents, I have a high history of myopia. My children now are becoming myopic. Is there anything that we can do? And then there would be the person who would also have that same history but a retinal detachment or something else. And it started bothering me that we really weren't doing that much for him other than bifocal glasses, which I was a proponent of at that time. But it just didn't seem to be as effective as I would like or they would like. And I started looking at some of the literature, and there were both animal studies and human studies that were coming out, and they were just showing how effective atropine was in slowing down myopia, so then when you finally got a couple of very interested patients, we put them on it. And we put them on atropine 1%. We put them in progressive pair of glasses in, uh, also that were photochromic. And to my surprise and happiness in theirs also, they weren't unhappy. They didn't have the photophobia that everyone complains about. The accommodative problems were not as bad as everyone said. So you started becoming, soon realized that was being overplayed. Okay, now was this prior to the Adam-1 study coming out? or Way before. Okay, so there were, there were studies at that point oh, yeah, to the, indicate that it no, was going to work. At, at, atropine, as I mentioned today, was first used by Cleopatra, but it's been used for myopia since the turn of the century. It really fell out of favor because um, patients were very uncomfortable because of the photophobia, because they're dilated and there were no photochromic lenses. And prior to uh, progressive lenses, um, they would only be able to see distance and near, and they would have no flex- flexibility in the intermediate zone. So it, it got dropped out. It didn't even get dropped out because it failed. It got dropped out because the, um, the, the side effects were worse than the benefits. Was there anything about the Adam-1 study when it finally came out, I believe that was in 2003, that either reinforced or caused you to maybe think differently about the way you were doing things? Well, it didn't really change it. What it, what it did do is it reinforced it because now you had a well-controlled uh, clinical trial um, which could clearly demonstrated the difference before that. But you had, even all the way back in the 1970s, the Bedrosen study, which used uh, one eye with atropine and the other eye as a control, and then they cross over to swap the right eye and the left eye. Those were very compelling studies. And uh, uh, subsequently, there was a Kennedy study over long-term effects of atropine. So they'd been around since the, the beginning 1970s. It wasn't new literature at that point. Okay. And then just a few years ago, uh, Adam 2 came out working on lower concentrations, half percent, quarter percent, one one hundredth of a percent, also one tenth of a percent, I believe. Yep, 0.01. The results are good, but with lower concentrations, perhaps not quite as good. Would you like to comment on that? Sure. Um, you know, putting a patient on atropine one percent, number one means they're going to be in glasses. Number two means that those glasses are going to darken and they're going to be progressive. 
So for the highly athletic kid or the kid who's more outside, not as much, who's not progressing as rapidly, the treatment is pretty, it's not, I wouldn't even use the word extensive because as I said, the, uh, the rate of dropout with atropine 1 percent is only 17 percent, but it's, it's almost a harsh treatment even though the kids don't complain. With the advent of lower dosages, it's easier to sell to both the patient um, and to the child um, and the parent and myself. Everyone's a little bit comfortable on it because you can go back into regular glasses. You can use an adjunct of ortho K if it's not working. It has so much application at this point. I think it opens up the whole use of atropine as a, as a treat mod modality for optometry. So we know that there are lots of options in terms of dosages. What do we know about the effectiveness of, let's say, 1% versus a half versus one-tenth or one one-hundredth of a percent? I think the literature is pretty clear that from 0.5% to atropine 1%, the effect is equivalent and it reduces the progression of myopia by about 95%. Once you go to the lower dosages, it gets a little confusing. There's one study by Sheen that was done in the late 19, 1999, which kind of suggested that as the concentration decreased, the effectivity decreased proportionally. Even with that decrease, it still was much more effective than doing nothing. The ADAM2 study suggests that once you get below that 0.5 percentage and you go all the way down to atropine 0.01, there is no difference in the effectivity um, when you change the concentration. And it's all approximately the same, which is about 50% effective. So um, that kind of suggests, you know, the lower the concentration, the, the less side effects, the better you're gonna be. The Shin study says, give the highest concentration that the patient can handle without side effects. And that's actually what we're trying to do from a research standpoint, is to find out what that optimum dosage is where the patients have minimal side effects and, uh, and be able to create that concentration. Now, are you currently personally involved in the, some of this research? You know, we've just finished a study to determine the maximum atropine dosage, which does not result in clinical symptoms of blur or photophobia, and minimum change in pupil size of two millimeters and having a combination more than eight diopters, if I remember correctly. And that count comes out to be about atropine 0.02 percent. The, the ADAM2 study kind of gives you the feeling that there's no dilation at all, That's, but that has not been our experience. And we also don't know, is it going to be different with Asians? Is it going to be different with Caucasians? Is it going to be different if your skin tone is dark, if it's light? Or, or there's so many variables in it. So those need to be sorted out. doesn't mean you can't use it to this point, but as uh, both clinicians and uh, proper types of doctors, we want to know that stuff uh, before we uh, continue prescribing it. Do we have any concerns about toxicity or uh, long-term usage is there any concerns about that? No, atropine happily was used in the beginning of the century for uveitis, and there were people who were on it for you know, 30, 40 years, and there was never a complication on it. There are MERGs, which show that there's no uh, retinal effectivity, and that's at atropine 1%. So uh, um, thinking that at the lower dosages that there's going to be a problem is highly, highly unlikely. If you look at all of most of the symptoms of atropine, it comes from utilization of atropine 1% in, in uh, small children whose body weight is much smaller than what we're using in six-year-olds. You're talking about kids who are one years of age, two years of age, etc. Are you currently using atropine in children that young, the, the, the one-year-olds, the two-year-olds? Two-year-olds for amblyopes because it's extremely effective and if, if you've... Uh, been taking care of amblyopic patients, you know how difficult it is to get a parent to put a patch on a child and the child not to take off the patch. 
putting a drop of atropine in when they sleep is a heck of a lot easier and the compliance rate goes up you know, accordingly. And atropine doesn't sting, sting like psycho, most of the psychoplegics. It's relatively comfortable. Okay. Do we have any real understanding of what the mechanism of action is for atropine in terms of re myopia reduction or myopia prevention? Interesting. We know it doesn't work the way almost all of us thought it works. The, uh, the logical thought process was that the reason why this works is because you paralyze combination. But with uh, a number of eloquent um, studies that were done on monkeys, it was demonstrated that uh, atropine would slow down the progression of myopia um, in those studies, even if the optic nerve was cut, if you put a diffuser over one half the eye, if you did it in animals that didn't uh, have smooth muscles for focusing. So the whole concept of atropine working on, by changing accommodation has been knocked out the, uh, the window. It's kind of attributed to that somehow pharmacologically it blocks the signal for the eye to elongate, but no one knows exactly what that mechanism is. Okay. You know, I think that one of the concerns that the average optometrist has with the use of atropine, I, I think that a lot of our colleagues are very uncomfortable with this. And I believe really it has to do with using a pharmaceutical modality on a long-term basis in children. As optometrists, we're accustomed to treating, let's say, glaucoma patients on a long-term basis, but they are adults. They're usually seniors. And I think there's this general reluctance. What would you say to the average OD out there to maybe make him rethink his position on this? I think there are two portions of your statement. I think that as a group, a lot of optometrists are still scared to use drops, medications, including steroid drops, or to treat glaucoma. They're, they're more apt to send those out. So that fear is somewhat inherent in our educational system, uh, which, is, which, which has been changing and will continue to change. The second portion of it, it's easy to, to prescribe a medication when an eye is red, painful, in danger of losing vision like glaucoma. So the justification of it is extremely easy. And as you alluded to before, it's always easier in an older person. Once you get to a child, and particularly for what is considered by many to be a benign condition like myopia, the concept of long-term medications frightens them, even though these can be very safe and benign medications. You tell them to put Pataday in, they're, they're pretty comfortable with that, but that, that, has some, that even has more of, of a problem from the standpoint of long-term basis. Pataday has been around for, for 15, 20 years, uh, and no one knows the long, long, long-term effects of that or any of the other allergy medications. Atropine has been around, as we mentioned before, for hundreds of years and has been used um, for care of patients for, since uh, the early 1900s for uveitis and inflammatory conditions on a long-term basis, and it showed you an incredibly good safety profile. You know, you, you touched on something a moment ago that I'd like to expand upon. That is that the optometric community at large views myopia as a benign condition. And I believe there was a study that came out recently to link risk factors or to compare the risk factor of myopia and long-term vision loss as being a stronger risk factor for, for blindness than high cholesterol is for heart disease. How do we get the message out to the average OD to make him understand that there really is something that we could and should be doing about our myopic patients? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I spoke to a number of retinal surgeons, and I said to them, do you consider myopia a disease, and do you consider it a disease that needs to be treated? And they're emphatic about it. I mean, to them, myopia is related to retinal detachments and other macular degeneration. I think what's getting lost is that we are both increasing the number of people in the United States, but we're also proportionally increasing the number of myopic patients. That's gone from 20% in the 1970s to 40% now, and if we go the way the Asian population goes, that will go to about 80%.
But we're not only increasing the number of myopes, we're increasing the total magnitude of myopia. And with both of those, you're increasing the risk of retinal detachment to a much higher level. And that becomes a greater risk after patients have cataract surgery. And it's not the surgery that initially does it because it happens after you, you land up doing the IAG capsulotomy. So as soon as that vitreous face is, is transformed, you increase the risk dramatically. And I think that if I was a, I wouldn't want to be a mile of, of a minus six in having been of an age where um, I have cataract surgery and having the risk of my retina falling off and becoming detached. I think that it's important for patients to be aware of that and to be able to respond to it by some form of treatment. My, myopia changes the the health of the eye. What is your current treatment regimen, and I know it will probably vary depending on the age of the patient and the severity of the myopia and the history of the case, but if you can give us some guidelines for, for the average listener who wants to implement or wants to consider implementing atropine into his practice for myopia control specifically, what would you recommend? Young, under the age of eight years of age, aggressive myopia with family history. I lean very strongly the utilization of atropine 1% each day with transitions and progressive glasses. Unless the kid is very athletic and the parents don't want to do that and they want to go to something like worth okay. Or they can elect to do nothing. It's really not my decision. My job as an optometrist is to present all the treatment options, the benefits and the risks and let the parent assimilate that and make a decision for their child. It's not my decision. But if the parent asks me which would be the best in that particular situation, I would lean towards using atropine 1%. If they're becoming myopic around eight years of age, now that depends on the kid. The kid who is more athletic is not gonna to wanna to wear glasses and is gonna be very happy going into ortho K. But I have kids, they don't want to give up their glasses. They don't want to put contact lenses at night. And I think it's, it's inappropriate for us not to give them other options if they're available. And those other options being atropine. And atropine in low dosages. Because that has been shown to be effective in slowing down the progression. Not as good as atropine 1%, but as good as ortho K. I feel that it is the parent's right to make the final determination of what's right for their child. You know, I understand that in China, that a very large percentage, if not almost every one of them, who gets fit into ortho-K lenses if they're young myopic children is also concurrently put on atropine therapy. Are you utilizing this as a dual combination or strictly one modality versus the other? How do you view it? That's a great question. The utilization of low dosages has just come into play in the last year or so. But it obviously has some strong interest in using it with either ortho K or something else from that standpoint, or like a soft contact lens. I think you know those, those are the studies that actually we want to do. We want to turn around and see what is the effect of adding atropine to ortho K um, or soft lens? There are those who tell me from an optical standpoint that the larger the pupil, the more effective ortho K is because you hit more retinal area, then it would seem sensible to add atropine in a low concentration to those patients who are not responding perfectly well to ortho K. But I can't tell you if that works or it doesn't work. No one has tested that modality as far as I know. The possibility, though, it's intriguing to me and because I, I think about it, and I actually do have a few patients that I have on concurrent therapy. And the idea of attacking two very different mechanisms of axial elongation, attacking it optically as well as attacking it pharmacologically, seems to make a great deal of sense. Do you have any any sense of how this has played out in China? Again, I know it's 
fairly popular. I, don't, I haven't seen any studies on it. Um, you just have to compare it, but I agree with you. It, it makes perfect intuitive sense. Um, there's no reason for you as a private practitioner not to add it. You just have to tell the patients and let them be aware of the fact that uh, there are no studies to support it, but it makes perfect sense. But I see no downside on the other hand either. So I think, you know, would I, if I had a patient who was in ortho K and they, they were progressing, I do the exact same thing that you're doing. I would add it, but uh, we're hoping that, you know, we can, we can answer that in a more uh, accurate way with some clinical studies in the future. But for the time being, do it. That's how, that's how we learn things. That's how we do things. We start off as clinicians and we take a look at what basic science or what's happened and then we try it clinically. And if it works, then it becomes our obligation to, to test it in the right ways to determine that if we're, what our clinical intuitions are, are, are actually clinically appropriate or not. You know, one of the issues that we do face with using lower concentrations of atropine is availability because it does have to be compounded and that can be sometimes tricky to find a compounding lab that can do it. And I know I've had colleagues mention to me that, well, they might think about mixing it up themselves. And I've always said to them, I don't think that's a very good idea. This needs to be done in a sterile environment. Do you think at any point in the future this is ever going to be available commercially in the United States in different concentrations? The first thing, let's go to the first portion you talked about. Uh, I would never, never, never formulate a medicine and give it to a patient. Um, that's what pharmacies are all about, and regular pharmacies won't do it. Only the special ones that have sterile compounding facilities should do that. So um, I have no intention of ever dispensing that out of my office or making it or thinking of making it. So that one's pretty clear to me. There is a problem in being able to get it. You know, the problem is that atropine is a generic drug. Since it's a generic drug, if you want to come out and make it commercially available in a lower percentage, then a company has to go back through the FDA and get approval. That's a very expensive process. Now, here's where the real problem comes from. After they get approval for it, since atropine was generic in the first place, the lower concentrated atropine then becomes generic automatically. So now you have a company that spent millions and millions of dollars to get a drug through, and the generic companies come along and profit. I've had this conversation with Bosch and Loam and Alcon, and they both told me clearly that there is no interest in getting involved in it for that reason. Okay, very good. What is your current therapy regimen? Let's say you're using whatever percentage, 1%, 1%, 1 percent, half percent, one one hundredth of a percent. How often do you have them use it? When do you have them use it? And for what duration? Well, there are studies that show that atropine 1% used once a week is almost as, as effective as atropine 1% every day. Since most of the studies have been done with atropine 1% every day, I, I use that as my dosage, and I haven't put it in at night. But if you dropped off twice a week or something like that, I'm sure you'd get just about the same effect. All the studies in the lower concentration have done with daily doses of atropine, I would not change that. And again, I would do that in the evening. The utilization of atropine 1% kind of ends when the child gets fatigued of it and wants to go into contact lenses. My experience, most of them start putting pressure on their parents around 13 years of age. And then you're at a time when the progression of myopia is slower than it was at 8, 9, 10, 11. So you probably don't need as effective as an agent as you did as early myopia. And those kids probably would be going into regular contact lenses with atropin 0.01% or ortho K without anything. The, the kids who are at the lower dosages, that becomes a little bit more confusing. We just don't know anything about it from that standpoint. But I guess you've got to keep them on until about 22 years of age or so. Okay, well, that's a long term. Maybe a little bit difficult for a lot of them to do, I think. 
We won't, we won't know that answer until the future. Oh, okay. How long have you been using atropine, let's say, in, a, in an individual patient? What's your longer, currently your longest term therapy patient on atropine? Child that I started at seven years of age and ended at 16. When we originally spoke in Chicago, one of the topics that we did not quite get around to was the rebound effect. And Dr. Cooper has been gracious enough to join me again specifically to discuss this topic of rebound. I know it's one of the issues that really concern a lot of docs, and I think it may be stopping a lot from actually wanting to use atropine in their practices. What can you tell us about the rebound effect? I'd like to uh, respond to that question by looking at it in three different ways. The first is to review uh, the numerous long-term studies that are out with atropine which are uh, atropine utilization of five years or older, um, correcting the interpretation of that uh, Tong paper, which is entitled Atropine for the Treatment of Childhood Myopia, the Effect of uh, Myopia Progression After Cessation of Atropine, which appeared in ophthalmology in 2009 because that's been vastly uh, misinterpreted. And then uh, look in the context uh, of all of this stuff in relationship to how we clinically treat myopia, um, when we use atropine 1% and stop it, because we really don't stop it, we change from atropine 1% to either lower dosages or ortho K. So um, let, let's start uh, with the first one, which is the long-term studies. Um, all the way back in 1979, uh, Patricia uh, utilized atropine, putting in one eye, artificial tears in the other eye, and followed these children for um, 90 children for four years on atropine. And uh, he found that um, the <coughs> the uh, non-atropine group progressed at 0.8 diopters per year, while the atropine group actually um, decreased in their myopia. And that's the important point, because uh, as you know, you don't really decrease in, in myopia. A in 1984 studied over 400 kids for uh, over nine years and also had some similar types of effects, again uh, showing that uh, atropine, if anything, decreased the amount of myopia. Um, and those, those are, are the same types of effects that were found in the Tong study. The main issue is Tong started the study two weeks after putting the patients on atropine. And why did he do that? Because if a patient is myopic, say minus three, when the patient goes on to atropine, they have a greater cycloplegic effect. And that effect brings them down to a minus two. So if we now follow these patients over a two-year period of time, what's going to happen? We're going to start from that minus two, and if we stop the atropine, they're going to rebound or go back to the cycloplegic level of a minus three. So right off the bat, whenever you look at any of these atropine studies, you're going to have a quick increase in the refractive error with no concurrent change in the um, axial length. So um, that was actually carefully noted by Tung. It wasn't noted by me. They actually show graphs. In their graphs, they show that the, that the patients that were placed on atropine showed about a half diopter decrease in the amount of myopia in the first two weeks compared to a traditional cycloplegic refraction. So obviously, when you take these patients off of atropine, they're going to have an increase in the amount of myopia equivalent to that difference between atropine and cycloplegia which is the reason why they showed this tremendous rebound effect. They also make the statement very clearly that the patients who had started on atropine ended on atropine after three years, including the rebound effect, showed a statistically significant and clinically significant decrease in the progression of myopia, which is still greater than you find with ortho pain or any other means. So. At the end of the day, um, the rebound effect 
is not really that significant. It is a a statistical error in the way that the study was designed and has no meaning. And lastly, let's assume that that even did occur. Whenever I use atropine 1%, I usually reserve that for the patients who begin their myopia very early, four, five, six years of age, and have parents who have significant myopia, um, who are very concerned about rapid progression, or a child showing rapid progression. And, and in reality, most of those kids get tired of, my, of utilization of atrine by 10, 11 years of age, and they're all switched into either atropine 0.02% or um, ortho-K, and that decision is on the basis of the choice of, of the child and the parent. It's not my choice. Just to make sure I've got this correct, the Tong study then did not really begin at baseline, and he reported that he didn't begin at baseline, and that's part of the reason why we're seeing this rebound, because it's not really a rebound. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And he addresses that in the discussion. I find it amazing that so many people have gone on to say that that study shows that atropine does not work because of a rebound study. It means either they've misquoted someone else they've heard or the person who read the study did not read the study properly. They're very specific in their conclusions and in the discussion. Do you think that there's any real difference between the dosage of atropine and any potential rebound effect? Would 1% give you a larger re rebound than one-tenth of a percent or one one-hundredth of a percent? It hasn't been clinically or scientifically studied, but you have to remember that the lower dosages are about half as effective without a significant psychoplegic effect. Particularly, you know, uh, we just published a study in OVS demonstrating that atropine 0.02% is the highest concentration that you can use without cycloplegic or madriosis effect. So, therefore, just taking it from that standpoint, it should have no effect on the baseline then. All right. So, if you could think about the future and... I know this is your primary area of myopia control. There are a lot of other avenues to explore, peripheral defocus, genetics. What other components do you think are really the primary movers of axial length elongation of increasing myopia? One of the things that I'm a little bothered in today's current research is being in Manhattan all the lawyers, all the people working on the, the computers, they're increasing their myopia. But the, the guards, the people who are in support, who are in those office buildings for the same number of hours, having the same limitation of sunlight, they don't seem like they're progressing. So I think that there's more to this story than simple outdoor light exposure. And I do think that we, we will eventually, if we have an FDA that allows it, come up with the right peripheral focusing disposable contact lens that might also be releasing the right muscarinic type of lens that's been modified not to cause dilation or accommodative changes and slowly secrete it into the eye so that you don't have to take a drop and it's the right contact lens to do it. And uh, I think that's the real wave of the future. That's an area of a huge interest right now just in the contact lens industry, using contact lenses as a drug delivery vehicle, not just as an optical device. That sounds kind of intriguing. I've not heard that one before. What else would you like to see in terms of atropine and its use and... Where would you like to see all this go? You know, I know you're, again, you're a big proponent of atropine, and again, op the optometric community has been rather slow to I'm adapt. I'm a proponent of atropine for one reason. It works. And 
most of the people who talk about the side effects and the reason why it's not um, and I would bet right off that they've never used it because that, that's that's the key I mean if you're if you're a clinician you got to have the patient somewhere that that really almost needs it like sitting with a with a parent where the kid was six years of age and was minus four and had a retinal detachment lost an eye and the question is what do you do about the other eye do you prophylactically treat that kid with atropine do you do you offer it do you not offer it what do you do um, actually I sat down with a retinal colleague and said what do you think what should we do should this kid receive atropine he says his biggest risk factor is not only his genetics, but increasing his myopia. His greatest risk factor, his risk factor for atropine toxicity or complications is not that high. If that were my kid and I was in that situation, I'd go on atropine. I think that's how you need to present it to the patient. Let them make the decision. Because no one knows the answer if that's the right thing to do or not to do. So rather do something that is very likely to help rather than just stand by idly and let nature take its course. Correct. We don't always know what is the right thing over the next 50 years. We're not going to be there. We're, we're not going to be practicing about it. You try to make your best decisions for your patients. But there isn't always a crystal ball. Okay. Well, on that crystal ball note, I thank you very much for your time, and, and I really appreciate you being here. And I think that um, maybe we've changed a few minds today. Uh, Hopefully. And I know that uh, atropine use does seem to be increasing. I have several colleagues I know who have started to embrace this slowly. But I think we're getting there. If, if you look when, actually, when I tried to do my first study at... State College of Optometry and had to go through an institutional review board. I was I was told by one of the members on there that I was actually murdering children and that it was poison and wrong to do that. And I think when I first put it on the blog for the Ortho K group, I, I got yelled at over the the blog. Now when I do the same thing, there's a totally different response. Even if they have not embraced it, they're not they're thinking about it. They think it's viable. They've reached that next step. Step number one is this is horrible, it's terrible. Step number two is that you're kind of against it, but... And the third step is, oh, I was never against that in the first place. And it just becomes part of us. You see that, you see that clearly in the utilization of optometrists with steroids. You know, when they, when they didn't have the right to use it, it was evil, bad stuff. Now it's their friends. I think the same thing's going to happen here. Okay. Well, very good. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you. And I appreciate all your work. Thank you. You've been listening to the Ortho K Podcast, brought to you by the Ortho Keratology Academy of America. Go to www.orthokacademy.com. The music for this episode was done by Meredith Wilson and is used with permission.